Every place the president goes, regardless of whether he's going to fly the helicopter or not, there is a Marine helicopter waiting in the wings. It takes an awful lot of people to support him. There's always an HMX-1 helicopter. And if he's going to fly, there will always be a presidential helicopter leading that detachment. When the president is in the White House or the president's at Camp David, there is an alert crew always there. And I won't give you the number of minutes, but you'll be extraordinarily amazed at how short we can be mm -hmm. at the pickup zone for him. Yeah. We'll probably be waiting for him, <laughs> but not the other way around. One of the perks the sitting president of the United States enjoys is particular travel privileges, whether it be a specialized 747, an armored limousine, or a particularly nice helicopter, as we'll talk about today with our guest, Jim Jamison. Hello, Jim. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Vincent. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Well, so we're going to talk about presidential travel via what we would think of as Marine One, but really it comes down to, what is it, HMX-1? HMX-1 is the squadron that has all the helicopters that support the president. Of course, that, that squadron does more than just that, and we're very proud of our, my service there years ago. I just did the math. It was 30 years ago in okay. my head, but uh, still very proud of uh, what, what those Marines were able to do for the president and the nation overall. Yeah. You know, you talked about transportation. If I may, it's yeah. it's much more than just transportation. It's really part of our national security apparatus. Whenever he gets on a 747, the uh, National Emergency Airborne Command Post, or uh, in this case, Marine One that we're going to be talking about, because it really is his traveling Oval Office. Yeah. That's where he would exercise command and control and does exercise command and control as the commander-in-chief at all times. So okay. it is very important that we provide a high level of executive transportation and lift, we would call it. Uh, but it's also equally important that we provide that continuity of government. Uh -huh. If something bad were to happen, that we were able <laughs> to provide an emergency relocation service, uh -huh. any one of those platforms is always ready to do that. So there's a national security implication yeah. as well. I look forward to digging into all of this because Good. you just see the president walk on or off the helicopter. You see the sharp looking Marines, you see the sharp looking helicopter, but you really don't know what goes on behind that. So I look forward to unpacking that. So Jim, let's start though with some semantics, may we? We think of the airplane as Air Force One. Well, it's the call sign when the president is on an Air Force airplane. Yes. When the president was on an S-3 landing on Abraham Lincoln, it was Navy One. And when the president bore a helicopter, and we have a model of one here that you brought. Thank you. It doesn't have to just be this one with the green and the white, but if it's a Marine aircraft, then it becomes Marine One, right? Yes, that's exactly right. And then one more thing is, historically, it has been true that all of our presidents have been males, so we will probably say he and his and him, and that says nothing for the future, so right. we'll just uh, go with what we've had so far. I understand. And before we do all that, though, let's get to know you a little bit better. Okay. Where are you from? Where did you go to school? And then talk us through your career up until you get to HMX-1, and then later on we'll come back to what you have been doing since. Okay. Um, so I was born in Appleton, Wisconsin, went to high school in New Jersey, and enlisted straight out of uh, Newark Academy into the United States Marine Corps at the Newark Marine Corps Recruiting Station. Gunnery Sergeant Drum did the honors in 1974. <laughs> Funny uh, how you remember yeah, that Gunnery. I remember him very well. <laughs> yeah. uh, my senior drill instructor as well, but we won't get into that. Sure. I uh, went to Paris Island Boot Camp, ended up graduating there, and then spent uh, the next couple of years in the Marine Corps rising in the rank of corporal, and then found myself at the Naval Academy kind of through the back door as an enlisted Marine, uh, and then took my commission in the Marine Corps and went into uh, naval aviation, uh, marine aviation, particularly helicopters, rotary wing helicopters, mm -hmm. uh, after my commissioning in 1980. Uh, and I stayed in the Marine Corps until uh, 2009. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for your service in advance. I usually save those accolades for at the end, but that's a long time. And so you went to helicopters and may I ask you, was that what you hoped to do? Or It was. I had an opportunity when I was at the Naval Academy during one of the summer training periods uh, to go to the uh, Naval Parachutist School in Lakehurst, New Jersey. Actually, we were there with a team of SEALs, which was a whole different experience, <laughs> but uh, was qualified as a Naval Parachutist. Our first airframe that we went out of was a old single-engine Huey. 
an echo model Huey uh, that took us up and went into an angle of bank at about 150 feet of 45 degrees. At least it seemed like it was 45 <laughs> degrees. Right. And we were all dangling off the side. And I, I said right there, I, I want to be a guy flying this, not the guy sitting in the back getting ready to drop out of it. And there was one Huey, my winging week, and I was able to get it. I was lucky. Okay, Huey's. All right, good. And so you did that for a tour, as I understand it. Several, yep. And then found your way over to what we called HMX1 before. Yes. And so that's what I'd really like to unpack okay. today. And then again, we'll come back to uh, some of that. First off, let me ask you this. Why have, and maybe this question is, isn't even a fair one because you already hinted at this, but why have in the first place a squadron or a unit dedicated to not just presidential, but really VIP travel. And I think, again, you already said it's not just that, right? They do a lot more. Exactly. Everybody that flies the president uh, has to have a Yankee white clearance, which is an extraordinarily high level of uh, basically um, you have the president's life in your hands. I'm not familiar with the Yankee white. Is that like, so I've heard of secret or top secret it, it is the top secret le- and it's a level within the top level like a within sub, top secret subset of yes, top secret exactly of so right. it's more than just information security that they're worried about there they're also worried about physical security okay so when you come into the squad and you usually spend the first six months to eight months even more sometimes everybody to, to include all the mechanics uh the security guards we have an entire company of marine mps that wow. support it there's a lot that goes into it that's why you have to have a dedicated unit to be able to to exercise it. Every place the president goes, regardless of whether he's going to fly the helicopter or not, there's a Marine helicopter waiting in the wings in an FBO, a hangar, uh, some available, uh, available wherever he is, whether he's at Kenny Bunkport or uh, this is President George H.W. Bush. Now, I'll speak to that because that's the president that I was uh, most able to serve okay. there. But there's always a Marine helicopter there. It takes an awful lot of people and an awful lot of helicopters dedicated to that mission to support him mm-hmm. and national security, uh, continuity of government and that yeah. sort of thing. Also, the aircraft are very specialized. We don't fly the VH-3D or the VH-60 in the uh, Marine Corps, in the fleet. You need to train in that before you uh, actually start taking people around in a natural uh, occurrence there. But um, so to have that is important. Hmm. That's, that's the reason there's a dedicated unit to it. And it also needs to be in close proximity to the White House. Uh, HMX-1 is the only tenant on the uh, Marine Corps Air Facility in Quantico, which sits right on this beautiful air, uh, air facility right on the Potomac River, and it's close enough to support the president. In addition, we have a alert facility. At any time, there are three helicopters in a very nondescript hangar very close to the White House, uh, ready to uh, react if there's some reason that we need to provide emergency relocation for him. Okay. That's the euphemism. Sure. Get him out of town. Yeah, yeah <laughs> there you go. And how does HMX-1 compare to any other Marine squadron? And in, in that regard already, I'm not as familiar with Marine structure as I would be, for example, in some of my squadrons, the VFA-94, let's say. We had about 200 people, mm-hmm. about 18 pilots, about 12 aircraft, but they were all F-18Cs. HMX-1 maybe is a lot like other Marine squadrons. I don't know, but I know you have different aircraft and you already said you had MPs. Yeah, the MPs is one di- uh, discriminator, certainly mm-hmm. with HMX-1. It's bigger. I'll speak to t- when I was there. Okay. We had an excess of 500 Marines wow. to include pilots, a very large ready room, because we flew five different uh, type model series aircraft. We needed that amount of people to maintain them. We also had those MPs. We also had a, a dedicated logistics debt from Sikorsky. Uh, some folks don't know that... HMX-1 enjoys a, back then, I don't know if it's still the truth uh, today, FAD-1 status, which is basically a wartime supply priority. Mm -hmm. So you never waited for a part. (laughs) And in fact, there was a closed loop uh, logistics system for parts on on these aircraft. Additionally, every part on the aircraft would be changed out at half time. Mm -hmm. So if a component would last 1,000 hours in the fleet, we change it out at 500, meaning you need a lot of mechanics because you're doing double maintenance to keep them in there. But the outshoot of that is the aircraft were always up. 
You know, typically another squadron in the Marine Corps would be proud of a uh, 76% availability rate. When it went below 100% at HMX-1, uh, it was all hands on deck, and they straightened that out very quickly. I bet. The other thing is we have two squadrons in the Marine Corps that are commanded by 06's colonels. Mm-hmm. Uh, HMX-1 is one. The other one is the uh, uh, Marine Weapons and Tactics Squadron out of Yuma that uh, hosts the WTI. And also the uh, the size of the squadron. Back when I was there, we had uh, about 30 aircraft. The only squadrons that would rival that that are what I commanded later on are HMLAs, Marine Light Attack Helicopter Squadrons. They need a n- large number of Hueys and Cobras because they serve Mu debts at the same time that they're deploying to the Western Pacific on the West Coast. East Coast is a similar thing. So mm-hmm. maybe that's uh, uh, too much detail. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, totally yeah. great. Good. And so when um, a squadron like this is operational, it has to be reactive to, in this yes. case, presidential travel, but is there also an element of, do they do some of the test and evaluation, but maybe that's yes. related to those aircraft? Actually, the history of HMX-1, 1 December 1947, started off, that was the mission, oh. uh, was to test new aircraft. Uh, you know, it determined uh, with the frontal assaults of World War II and the uh, new nuclear age that we're going to need a more distributed capability, offensive punch capability. And vertical envelopment was just uh, envisioned at that time. So HMX-1 was stood up. Uh, actually, Igor Sikorsky came, I think, uh-huh. to the commissioning of it to experiment. And the X is for experimental. We continued on that uh, dual mission or that main mission of operational test and evaluation all the way up until 2014. That was after I left. I left in 1992. Uh, so it continued on. Uh, and they would do the assault support test and evaluation. The attack evaluation was done elsewhere, but uh, CH-46, say when the bullfrog was coming in, or we were going to do the new monocle uh, for the uh, NVDs on the uh, CH-46. We would test it there on the green side. So we had a whole capability of CH-46, CH-53, Deltas, and Echoes, in addition to our white side, which uh, were these VH3Ds, uh, which I have a model of here, and the VH60s. When I first got to the squadron, we were flying VH1Ns, Mm. and we swapped out those halfway through. Mm. Okay. So the green side is sort of the more traditional Marine roles, and the white side is sort of the VIP uh, white glove treatment. Right. (laughs) And so the green side would support, uh, for instance, the basic school Marines going through that, and they would uh, teach them vertical envelopment tactics, techniques, and procedures, and that sort of thing. And then, you know, actually lift them in and out of LZs and in practice. The overlap would be that those greenside aircrafts then did double duty uh, supporting the Secret Service and the press. Ah. While the president and his entourage would fly in the white tops, uh, the press and the Secret Service support team uh, would be in the green top aircraft. During my time, 53 Echoes and uh, CH-46s primarily, occasionally the 53 Delta. Ah. Okay. So you are a, dare I say, run-of-the-mill fleet Huey pilot. Yep. At some point, does the Marine Corps come to you and say, hey, this is what we want you to do next? Or is it more like, again, I have to relate it to my own experiences, but when I wanted to go to Top Gun, I pretty much had to apply. And I'm of the understanding that it's the same for the Blue Angels. So is it more they tap you or you put your name in the hat? A little bit of both. Uh, you start the process by saying you're interested. And okay. then the way that works is HMX-1 sends out a... Back then, I don't know if they still do this, I would send out a team of recruiters, if you will, and they would go to, when I got recruited, if you will, I was at uh, HMT-303, which is the replacement air group, or what we would call now the fleet replacement squadron. So I was an instructor pilot there. The reason that they would go to these squadrons rather than just, they would go to all the squadrons, but they spent a lot of time going to the replacement squadrons because the instructor pilots there tended to have a lot of hours. Okay. And you had to have 2,000 hours just to be considered. Oh, wow. Because they wanted that strong foundation of flight uh, to be able to transition into these aircraft quickly and efficiently and well when well, you got to the squadron. But also, you're doing missions that are not just run-of-the-mill Marine missions. You might be right. landing on unprepared surfaces in yeah. different places everywhere, which right. I guess I'm not a helicopter pilot, obviously, but I understand you're trained to that already. Yes. But now you're landing just visually on grass. And actually the flying that we, we yeah. would do with the executive lift mission for the president was uh, much more 
we would never put them in a position where we'd go into a dusty zone where we'd worry about brown out or something oh, okay. like that. All the zones are very well prepared <laughs> by, you know, it's a, it's a team effort. Somebody else is working on that for us. Uh, even in addition, when we land on the south lawn of the uh, White House, there are three six-foot diameter uh, wooden targets, if you will, okay. that we put the three wheels on. That's a whole technique that we practice at Quantico. We actually have a practice uh, LZ that. where we practice putting it perfectly in the middle of that. But it's actually easier flying because you're not going to yank and bank. You're, you don't need to worry about tactical things you would in the fleet. However, you are flying the, the leader of the free world and you have to make sure that you're keeping him safe. So you do employ some of the tactical wits about you, sure. the wits that you developed in the fleet in terms of profiles that you're flying, routes that you're flying, you would always vary those. The uh, uh, three aircraft would all take off, but you'd never know which one the president was in. So three white tops <laughs> would take off and the president might move around uh -huh. the, the pilots. All that maneuvering was always done outside the view. The president's on the left-hand side with the large window. You would never maneuver an aircraft uh, formation. You would never see another. They would always be on the right side of the aircraft. Interesting. But those are some techniques to keep him safe. Right. So the point, though, the pilots should be basically able to just do the job without a lot of fanfare and we don't need to be learning as we go so right. 2000 hours is the threshold that was set right. to say hey here's people that know what they're doing exactly you yeah. you have your instrument all your instrument quals you're fully right. qualified you're getting back to the uh, uh, qualification or the recruitment you've uh, attained a good reputation within your individual community because we we select from Hueys Cobras back then 53s today V22s mm. uh CH-46s, all the different squadrons are represented there. So yeah. you're right. We need to have re established a good reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, then the squadron actually does the selection. It's not done from headquarters Marine yeah. Corps. Back then, I'm not sure it still is, there's a very informal book that goes around with your name in it, uh, <laughs> and people uh, put a check mark or, or they don't put a check mark. Mm. Hey, I know something good about this guy that put it down there. I know something you should know about this guy. Uh -huh. Maybe you shouldn't know. And it's all very close hold, but the selection is ostensibly made by the CO of HMX-1, who is a colonel, based on the reputation that, that the pilots have already garnered within the those that are in HMX-1. Gotcha. So HMX-1 sort of selects their own. That okay. Way. And then I would assume, and I think you talked about this before, there's probably a pretty extensive background check. And oh, yes. Talking to references and all and that. And so they, yeah, part of the recruitment is, uh, you know, they, they make sure that you're going to be able to pass the Yankee White, which is all the background checks. I mean, they went back and talked to my high school football coach. <laughs> I mean, all, all those things, which fortunately I yeah. wasn't, I was a fair to middling player, but I, I, I guess I behaved okay. Yeah. Uh, but, Maybe uh, it wasn't so much about your skills. No, it wasn't. They weren't interested were in my skills. With? Was I a troublemaker? <laughs> and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. And it's not like you couldn't have had a brush with the law. You know, maybe you had a, an incident. But if you were up front with the investigators, right. uh, they would look at it and they would determine whether that was a big deal or not. What you would never do was want to conceal something from the investigators. Uh, you always want to be up front. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to worry about that, but others did. And if they were up front about it, they got their Yankee white. It just took a little extra digging. Right. And I think that's probably a great lesson for anyone in any situation is uh, just come clean and exactly. admit your mistakes. And unless it was willful or if you really are trying to hide something and then guess what? They'll probably figure that out. Yes, sir. Yeah. So is that same scrutiny applied to the different people at HMX-1? Absolutely. Okay. To give you an example, the physical layout of it, uh, of the actual hangar is called the cage okay. because it's physically uh, locked into a cage. <laughs> Anybody that goes in that cage uh, and works in there and works on the president's helicopter has a Yankee white clearance. Okay. So it's an extraordinarily expensive investment. That's why uh, typically an enlisted Marine or, or an officer will, will spend four years there at a minimum. Sometimes the enlisted Marines will, will hitch up for another one and go eight years, uh, depending. You know, you want to get them back out on the fleet for their career development. You don't want them spending all their time in a cage in Quantico. They're working on aircraft that are very similar, if not the same, that they'll be working on in the fleet. Mm -hmm. When the enlisted Marines, the mechanics come in, the hydraulics men and the avionics men, they, they'll work on the green side until their Yankee white is complete. Oh. They may continue their entire career on the green side, never go in the cage. 
but that gives us a, the year-long interview, as we call it, uh, and they'll pull those mechanics in that uh, they want into the cage with that. Mm-hmm. So It makes sense. Four years, I mean, you want to get some return on investment, right. as much effort as it is to get somebody into the cage, as you yes, put it. So exactly. Make sure you get your money's yeah. worth. <laughs> and so the ready room kind of breaks itself up into freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, ah, I see. the four years that you're there. <laughs> so you don't get to say anything when you're a freshman. Of course. You know? All right. <laughs> so, and then, so if you get in the cage and you're there and you're mm-hmm. ostensibly going to be selected to fly VIPs, yes. like you said earlier, these are aircraft you don't already have. And in fact, the Navy used to have the H-3s, but no longer does. Right. So is all the training in-house or is there... All a- the training is in-house. Okay. Uh, back then, we the Navy did have H-3s and we would go down and borrow their simulator as part of our training track. But it's all in-house, uh, learning five different NATOPS manuals. Uh, at, at one time, I was signing for four different four as helicopter aircraft. <laughs> Aircraft commander, so there was a there was an awful lot to learn. Fortunately, we had all those resources right there. We had wonderful instructor pilots within each one of the aircraft type model series. Uh, for example, I I decided to transition when we got rid of the Hueys. Didn't get rid of them, but we put them in the Davis uh, Montham right. Boneyard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we got the H sixties, I decided to transition into the CH forty six so I could help on the green side as well. Because once you become a, a presidential command pilot, that doesn't mean that's the only billet you're going to fly. Right. You'll be flying many other missions as well. Hmm. Anyway, so fortunately, uh, we had wonderful instructor pilots who were. Typically, uh, FRS uh, instructors, before they got there, as I said, they're very experienced, and they transitioned us pretty well. Yeah. There's always a minimum before you can be a co-pilot uh, for the president. Back then, you had to have at least 50 hours in the model that you were going to fly them. Okay. If you were going to sign for it and be the helicopter aircraft commander, the Marine One pilot, the presidential command pilot, uh, you'd have at least 100. In reality, you'd have many more than that. Those were the thresholds. During my time there, I think I got... 1,350 hours in those four years. You do a lot of flying and a lot of uh, different models. So if you were in combat, your logbook might have green ink, at least in the Navy we call it. Yeah. Is there like a certain color ink if you're actually flying the president? There's actually a stamp really? uh, that, that will be a Marine One lift stamp that's the right um, level for each one of those columns in there. So they'll put a stamp yeah. in there for that if you actually carry the president or the vice president okay. or a head of state. Uh, uh, so uh, they, all three, uh, HMX-1 uh, is charged with not only the president worldwide, but the vice president in the D.C. area and also all he- visiting heads of state had uh, some wonderful experiences. We would pick them up at uh, the LZ at the end of the reflecting pool. So you're looking down mm. the power of the democracy there. Abe Lincoln is looking at you as you're putting uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in the helicopter and taking him on a on a ride. Mm-hmm. A bit of a funny vignette with uh, with him and his entourage. Uh, this was all during uh, detente and when we were opening up uh, relations with the Soviet Union. So it was important that we put on a, a, a good show for him. Mm-hmm. And don't know who made the decision, but we were going to take uh, Gorbachev and his party on a low-level flight over the battlefields of Gettysburg. We had two foot by one foot lithograph maps of every battle. I mean, they were eye watering. I'm not even sure that they understood what we were doing, but it was certainly instructional for us uh, when we did that. The H3D has a bar in it. When we landed, all the crystal that said, welcome aboard Marine One and all the little bottles of liquor in case you want them were all gone. Uh, now, we don't think it was, was Gorbachev. We think it was probably his, his entourage. But uh, the squadron had been directed to make a uh, flight jacket, a, a standard naval flight jacket, uh, and put his name tag on it and uh, have a presidential patch on it uh, to give it to him. We did, and he flew in that during that mission. And he decided after that mission was over, he came back and said, hey, please give this back to the president thank you that was the only gift that we, that we were giving him and that's the one that we get, was given back with that oh dear. So, yeah. you know as i'm talking about the interior the vh3d or the vh60 we could have a conversation when it's running at full tilt uh you know flying at cruise uh with the same decibels that we're using right now and we'd be understood perfectly nice because it's got about eight inches of uh insulation all yeah. around this and it's beautifully appointed in leather uh now, interestingly, the president's seat is a stroking CH-53 tactical seat underneath this beautiful leather cushion. You'd never know it, but we would, depending upon who the uh, VIP was going to be sitting there, we would go and dial in that weight 
uh, because that's a safety. If you had a hard landing, which we never did, but if you had a hard landing, right. uh, that stroking seat would be uh, one of the ways that we would protect the president. <laughs> Doesn't hurt that it uh, was made out of Kevlar, and it's also uh, <laughs> impervious to uh, anything up to a 7.62. Wow. So yeah, well, they don't leave really anything unthought of, do they? <laughs> no, they don't. Yeah. Uh, the entire aircraft is EMP hardened because it really was a product of the Cold War, yeah. and so we had to be able to com- continue to communicate and operate as a Oval Office uh, in case of an electromagnetic pulse that would be associated with a nuclear blast. It's hard to think of that then, but back in 1988 when we got there, the mission was to get him out of town in case of a nuclear attack. Right. Yeah. And and we practiced that, and we had rendezvous procedures, and I won't get into the details of it, but it was, it was the main mission. Yeah. Uh, executive lift and carrying him comfortably was important, but the main mission was continuity of government during time of Cold War. That makes sense. I mean, that is what's needed to keep the country moving Absolutely. and to respond accordingly. And there's some movies about you know, what that could look like theoretically. Yes. You talked earlier about some of the helicopters that are available in nondescript hangars near the White House and yeah. and somebody's always ready. I mean, right, if the president needs to go somewhere, we're not going to say, oh, sorry, we're all at a party and everybody's been drinking. Right. So my guess is part of the reason you have such a big ready room and such a big command at HMX-1 is I have to think it's probably a watch bill or something, you know, military we call it, where, hey, you've got it for this many hours and, right. oh, by the way, not just you, but you back up. Right. And so, right, everyone takes their turn being right. available or maybe yep. actually flying. Well, that nondescript hangar in the D.C. area is in a place called Anacostia, mm-hmm. which is actually an old Air Force base. It's uh, now we're D- right near uh, where the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency is now. Okay. And that's not classified, I can tell you that. But uh, there are three H-60s, VH-60s, uh, behind uh, those three blue doors that are all automated. The mat outside is all heated with uh, water in case it's icy. Speed is of the essence, and we're not going to wait to clear the uh, the mat to take the aircraft out uh, that that's important. There is a watch bill, and you go up to Anacostia, or we would use, euphemistically call it Annie, uh, with a cooler wor- worth of food, and you'd lock yourself in there for three days uh, mm-hmm. with all three crews, avionics men and a hydraulics men, in case there was something that needed to be done, along with the crew chiefs, who are really the unsung heroes. You know, th- those Marines that you see that are real sharp in their blues at the bottom of the ramp when they come out, whether it's the 60 or the 3, those Marines are, are working crew chiefs. They're not eye candy. They're the ones that prepared, cleaned, pre-flighted that aircraft that day. Uh, and then they get in their uniform and they you know, render that salute that's so iconic. Yeah. Speaking of that, what would be their MOS? Is that an actual air crewman of some sort? So, yes, they do. They come to us typically already. At, we don't home grow uh, sometimes out in the fleet uh, crew chiefs. Uh, we don't do that. They come to us with their air crew wings already. Okay. They're the best of the best. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that was uh, really fun for us um, was with President George H.W. Bush, when we would go to, say, uh, some area, say, out in Illinois or whatever, and we're in LZ, and he's going to be addressing an RV convention or something. When he would get off and make his first remarks, he would have found out if there was anybody on that crew or HMX-1 that was stationed in that hometown. And he would say, you know, thanks to the good work of Joe, uh, and he gave, give his name. Uh, I'm here safely to give this speech, and you know I'm really grateful to that. And uh, you know he would often, if it wasn't on the White House lawn, typically that's a little too high vis. He would always stop at the bottom of the ramp and talk to the crew chief. You know, hey, hey, Bob, the the aircraft looked great today. Yeah. You know, he would learn. There was only five crew chiefs that would do it back then. Wow. He would learn all their names. He really cared about the people. You know, we weren't in the inner circle, uh, but you could see it from where we were. But we weren't trusted advisors or anything. But we were trusted employees to provide that service day to day. And then, uh, you know, we were also trusted in case something went wrong. We were the people that were going to do it for them. All right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I always wondered if it was so many people at the bottom of the ladder, it was just whoever it was that day, or I guess it sounds no, like it's, about five. It's really, oh, um, it's great. It, it is, and the numbers may, may change now, sure. but uh, that it was a manageable number. Uh, the standardization is, as you might imagine, we do everything through NATOPS, of course, right. but we also have an additional layer of standardization with executive lift procedures, uh, whether that be... Um, 
our rendezvous procedures that are going to be uh, taken to get them out of town, that sort of thing. Interestingly, uh, while I was there, the VH60 and the VH3 were both retrofitted to have the same glass cockpits. Now, this is the 80s. We had glass cockpits, all CRTs, with data transfer modules, and we would keep the uh, secret top-secret plans. That was my day job. I was a top-secret plans officer. We would keep them wrapped in a physical DTM, a data transfer module, uh, double-wrapped, top-secret. Uh, if the uh, balloon went up, unwrap it, punch it into the nav system, and it would give... The pilots didn't need to know where the rendezvous point was when they were going because they were going to be told at the time they needed to know it. Huh. And that's one way we kept it secure. Yeah. Well, that's what's fun about a conversation like this is there's all these little details unless you've lived the life that you just don't know. So yeah. I'm afraid this interview might devolve into me just asking you all these things I'm excited to know yeah. about because I've always wondered. And one of those is the president or the VIP in question boards from the left side. But correct me if I'm wrong, in a helicopter, generally the aircraft commander <laughs> sits on the right. Yes. So do they reverse that in no. this case now? <laughs> no, that's a very good point. Because you see his face in the window yeah. a lot of so times. So every Marine pilot that has a picture of him with the president coming down that ramp that iconic picture, and mm -hmm. I have one of those. He's the co-pilot that day, <laughs> you know. And it doesn't mean that he isn't qualified to be the pilot, but that's what his he, that was the straw he drew that day. The one that I remember the most, I was flying with the CO. So I may have been a presidential command pilot, and I was. But if the CO's there, the CO is going to sign for the aircraft, <laughs> and that sort of thing. So yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. And so if you're flying over to make the pickup, it might just be the three of you, the two pilots and the crew chief? Yes, typically that's all because mm -hmm. the, uh, the so aircraft, right. as great as it is, mm -hmm. uh, and they've, they continually update it, is from the 60s. You know, probably no part on it is from the 60s because they keep replacing them, but it is not overpowered. And that LZ in the South Lawn is not an easy one. The joke at HMX-1 is the most powerful man at the White House is the gardener because we want to trim back some trees. <laughs> you know, you can't trim back the trees. That's that's part of the, uh, you know, this environment here that yeah. the you know, White House is. And uh, so one of the reasons that we can't really, we couldn't take a, say, a, a uh, on a regular basis, take a 53 Echo in there, which has a lot of capability and no shortage of power. Uh, it would blow every bush down, every flower would be gone, the uh, the lawn would be scorched. Uh, you know, we, we really need to balance that out. Yeah. So uh, we were able to, uh, on paper, take uh, 13 passengers. And what we would do is we would fuel it such that we could do the emergency relocation service, mm. but no more. Uh, so we'd have a little extra weight so that we could provide that for the extra passengers. Typically, the president would have less than that. Normally, a party would be uh, the president and six, something like that. And that was more of an inner circle thing than it was everybody piling on with the president. They would go on the uh, Dash 2, uh, Nighthawk uh, 2, that would be in the flight, but not with the president helicopter himself. Okay. And so as much as possible, Jim, is there like a way, people ask me this, like, hey, Jello, what's a typical day on an aircraft carrier like when you're deployed? Like, every day is different. But from the point of view of being a Nighthawk pilot, is there yeah. a typical day or maybe if you're on one of those watch bills or right. not? But Yeah, so uh, it's different if, if you're in CONUS than if you're overseas. Mm -hmm. So if we're in garrison, if you will, if we're at Quantico in the hangars, you come in like any normal day, depending upon when you're flying. You know, to meet uh, crew day, you don't come in earlier than 12 hours before you're going to land. It's a safety uh, consideration. Uh, and you would do your day job. Uh, you would go into the ready room. You'd find out any, uh, you know, look up typical stuff, what's the weather, no TAMs, that sort of thing, to be ready to go. Because sometimes those missions get moved up, sometimes they get moved back, sometimes often they get canceled. So you will have many missions there that, you know, maybe the president wants to do this, uh, but maybe not. Uh, and so that's one of our environments. The other environment is overseas. And that's when we, uh, as I said, wherever the president goes, there's always an HMX-1 helicopter. And if he's going to fly, there'll always be a presidential helicopter leading that detachment. So you're really a detachment leader, typically doing the uh, local flight schedule, uh, making sure that uh, things are going right with the detachment, and then each one of the flights are going uh, properly that are on the schedule for mm -hmm. that day with that. And then the third and the big I mentioned already is the time when you're on alert duty. Uh, that's those folks that when the president is in the White House or 
the presidents at Camp David or the presidents at Kenny Bunkport at Walker Point during my experience. Uh, there is an alert crew always there, and I won't give you the number of minutes, but you'll be extraordinarily <laughs> amazed at how short we can be mm-hmm. at the pickup zone for him. Yeah. We'll probably be waiting for him, <laughs> but not the other way around. But Jim, if you're doing something with the president, let's yes. say here in California, yes. whereas normally he's in Washington, yeah. D.C., then you know it's the United States of America. Hey, FAA, this is what we're doing. Keep, stay out of yes. the way. Clear the airspace, et cetera. Let's say you go to Denmark, uh, uh, foreign country, or Germany, or wherever. Yes. Now, right, it's it's the leader it of is. America, but we're in a different country. I, I'm assuming there's a lot of coordination, probably the uh, State amazing. Department and everybody else is State involved. State Department, FAA has a long reach. Okay. Uh, local law enforcement, FBI has a piece, the DIA, oh. all of the intelligence services all bear in. But to answer your specific question about uh, clearances and that sort of thing in foreign countries, we send a White House liaison officer who is just another pilot at HMX-1. They might be a presidential commander pilot, they might be a, some other designation, but during that time, they put on a, a three-piece suit back in the day, I don't know <laughs> if they do that still, and they will go in advance of any overseas uh, party, and they would be with a team of Secret Service agents and other interagencies, State Department being one, and they would go and make sure everything was taken care of and coordinated days before the president ever arrived, to include finding the emergency relocation LZs if we had to get them out, what hospital would he go to if there was an, an incident, and that sort of thing. So it, it's always important to know that. And I found that out uh, firsthand, uh, how important that uh, pre-flighting the area is. Uh, when President Bush, George H.W. Bush, was in Japan and had that unfortunate incident, I don't know if you remember, he threw up on the, uh, yeah, the had a uh, problem at a dinner, prime I minister at a dinner. Mm-hmm. Secret Service didn't know what it was, so they rang the klaxon, which is the loudest darn thing in the world in our temporary hangar. We launched immediately into some of the worst weather I've ever been in, icing conditions with a ragged 300-foot ceiling, uh, and we're doing silly circles waiting to go in and pick him up and take him to the hospital or get him out of town if there was a threat or something like that, and it was harrowing as we went around, but it it was our job, and after about 20 minutes, uh, they determined president just had gastritis and he's going to be fine. He was very apologetic to the prime minister, of course, uh, but he continued a a, a day. He had actually been playing tennis that morning and continued with his his schedule the next day. But uh, so things are happening in the background with that. None of that would have happened without that team making sure that the helicopter might launch. And when we launched, it was whatever you need. They cleared the airspace for us. One time we went into um, O'Hare. I felt terrible about it because normally we try to go to a smaller airfield. That's a busy airport. (laughs) Yeah, and they were putting the the, uh, civil aircraft, in, you know, the the commercial aircraft in a silly circle while we came in, uh, you know, to give us a bubble. So this is the kind of thing that's done for Marine One. Uh, Not so much for Nighthawk, uh, but a little bit. But when you have the president on board, everybody bends over backwards to make sure it's done well. But that coordination, as you said, starts days prior with a team that's, uh, that's hard work and they do it. Yeah. Well, and you almost sounded, dare I say, for put words in your mouth, a little apologetic for the way they reacted to President Bush's incident. But right, I have to think it's maybe getting off base here a little bit, but it's sort of the Secret Service's job is to assume the worst. Maybe he was poisoned. Absolutely. Maybe, yeah. I completely agree. I didn't never would question their 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 judgment, but yeah. I think they have a hair trigger to do that. I do know that the people over at the uh, White House military office, the uh, WAMO is what they call it. Okay. Unfortunate <laughs> acronym. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they they loved it when you're at Anacostia. Invariably, they love to do a drill. So they'll just hit the button for for the claxes to go off at Anacostia. Those three doors open up. We have the huffer starts. So the, the H-60s are starting as they're being towed out. Uh-huh. Uh, pilots are climbing in as they're being towed out. I mean, it's a bit of a moving target. And they, they launch, and we do a pre-designated route that, that comes across on that drill. Uh, so we are heavily drilled. And, you know, flying around D.C. at 200 feet is the license to steal. But it's right there in the airspace of National Airport. Yeah. And we're not shutting National Airport down. We just fly underneath. Yeah. But you have to be careful at night. <laughs> I imagine. I imagine. I've taken off and landed out of National a couple oh, times. Yeah. And it, it gets my attention, especially taking off to the north. Yes. to make that turn right away. But yeah. I, I guess that's the point. And it reminds me of, I've had many people sitting in the seat over the years of podcasting. And 
mostly we've talked in the past about the nuclear response during the yeah. Cold War. So it sounds very similar. They'd be sequestered somewhere, and invariably there'd be some sort of test. Can you rouse everybody, get them out to the airplane, right. and get all the airplanes airborne, tankers right. and everything, and then call them all back. Exactly. So, so. Make the rendezvous. There are places, you know, Cheyenne Mountains is known, but there's other places, alternate uh, national military uh, command posts that are deep underground. Yeah. Whether they would actually work or not, uh, unknown. I've heard people question that. Uh, yeah. but. If he's on board, the first step is to get him to a platform that can get him to one of those places. Mm -hmm. There are some within range, but that's not the preferred way uh, to go. It would not be the preferred way. Yeah, yeah. A lot of teamwork with that. A lot of pre same thing. A lot of pre coordination, contingencies plans for this yeah. and that, and everything's thought of of how how are you going to get fuel when all the electric is down? And there are ways to do it, and we <laughs> have the right equipment to do that. Yeah, uh, yeah, you sure. know, the aircraft is, as I said, EMP and hardened, but it's it's uh, fitted out with a full suite of the latest uh, aircraft survivability equipment. So whether that be at the time it was an ALQ-144 uh, IR jammer, uh, again, not secret, uh, but that was one of our capabilities. But there's a, a variety of those, and it is pretty, but it's pretty capable yeah. as well. Well, and I don't know how much we're allowed to talk about that. Yeah. You said at the beginning it's been 30 years, and yeah. I'm certainly not looking to get you in trouble. But right, they're going to outfit these aircraft with things to protect ostensibly the most powerful man in the yes. world. And so they're not going to just leave it to chance. So you talked about, and if I understood the ALQ-144 correctly, yeah. if they think it's an IR missile coming, they can like send an IR sort of like beam to it to kind of... That's not it. actually technology. It's sort of a. Is it um, different? It's sort of a always on passive cloaking. Oh. That's not the real technology, but that's the concept. All right. Yeah. And then there's also expendables, so chaff and fire. expendables, and but as you might imagine, we wouldn't want an inadvertent um, discharge on the White House lawn. So <laughs> there's procedures for that as well. Yeah. Uh, but yes, there's no, no I.e. Like, e. like when you arm the system or something? Yes, exactly. Okay. A, right. a stray uh, electron, uh, we, we don't take the chance on that on the lawn. Sure. You know, All so right. with that. But I will tell you that the uh, VH-60... Uh, is a more capable aircraft than the VH-3 in terms of the emergency relocation service that we talked about. And certainly aircraft survivability, it has a higher G rating, and that's all public okay. information. Sure. But they have to bend over, the president does, to get in and out. Because that door on the H-60 uh, doesn't allow them to enter or stand uh, dignified, or, stand dignified <laughs> or or to give the okay. peace sign on your last ride <laughs> or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. The actual principals prefer the H-3, and so their staff prefers the A-3. Of course. But the 60 is perfect for stuffing in the back of a C-17 or C-5. We always get out there out to where he's going overseas three to four five days in advance. Okay. That's the other reason you need a big squadron. You've got a lot of people that are distributed. So when he goes overseas, he doesn't typically uh, go to just one spot. So one time he went to uh, Australia and two different places in Australia that were far enough apart that you couldn't support it with one H-60. <laughs> so the C-5 back then, we still have them, but that's what primi primarily what we used, would go to all these different places in advance of the president's visit, four different sites, um, Egypt, Australia, Australia, Philippines, and Japan, I think, wow. were the uh, ones there and would drop off uh, the helicopters. And when we put the helicopters back together, then we go and we rehearse where the uh, LZs would be. He's not planning on flying it because we never fly unless there's at least three so that we'd have that safety margin. Which one's he in? We don't know. But it's there for the emergency relocation if he needed. You still have to rehearse where those LZs are, where the hospital is and all that. And also we like to fly five hours after any component on the aircraft has been pulled off to make sure that the president is getting into a full up round. Uh, so it takes, yeah. a, there's a lot of flying that goes on before he act for a 20 minute flight. We might fly five and a half hours on that airframe. Wow. Yeah, well, again, right? Everything needs to be seamless. Plus, there's a lot of, and I'm going to hope to make this interview, uh, you know, free of any political talk. But oh, yes. some of it, too, though, is we have to make the president look his best. Sure. So everything is all about optics and it's got to work, et cetera, et cetera. Let me ask you this, though. You talked about the three aircraft that might take off and you don't know which one. Mm -hmm. Do they ever play any games? Like, for example, I heard that Taylor Swift, who's about like moving the president, I, I, I imagine, <laughs> like got put in some sort of like little, like, 
I don't know what it was, some thing, and they moved her through. Like, you couldn't tell it was something to put somebody in. It was like a, almost the hotel carts that, like, come to oh, your door and, and yeah, refresh. No. So it, they, like, moved her out one way, and, and this went the other way, and she was in it. So Will they ever put the president in something and not call it Marine One, like, off to the side or no, something? No, he always will fly in a Marine aircraft because of the that half-life, all the maintenance things I told yeah. you about, all the Yankee white, uh, there are just uh, too many risks otherwise. Yeah. He has occasionally flown in one of our green top aircraft, Katrina. Uh, now, that was after my time. I noted that he flew in a CH-46 on that, but it was a Marine CH-46 Okay. with that. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Not very good. Yeah. yeah, it's again, right? You just don't know what sort of games they might play in, in the systems and right. on the aircraft. But Well, part of the problem, you, you're right. Now, they may use that uh, technique now. Uh, one of the problems is, you know, wherever he goes, the Marine Major or Air Force Major or Navy Lieutenant Commander, the football carrier uh, with the nuclear codes, even till today, has to be them. Hmm. But you have to imagine that was quite a uh, priority then. He has an entourage that really can't be broken up. You really don't want him very far out of sight of the Secret Service at any one time. You know, you want him right next to them. So it would be, I think, difficult logistically to, to kind of cordon him off in a small uh, vehicle. Uh, yeah. He carries a large entourage for good reason. Even I understand, I wasn't involved, yeah. but uh, from hearing about when there was a Navy one, yeah. when the next oh, yes. President Bush flew, yeah. I guess they had one Secret Service in the ejection seat in the back of the S3, <laughs> yeah. and of course a bunch waiting when he talk, took off, yeah. and a bunch waiting where he was going, right. but just one en route there for that little yes. bit. Yeah. And probably some aircraft next to it, I would imagine. Yeah, I think there were probably people pulling their hair out, uh, <laughs> frankly. Uh, but yeah, they got innovative. So yeah. uh, great exception to prove the rule. Yeah, yeah Navy won. And that was good for him. Uh, good for Navy be able to, to support him the way he wanted it yeah. to be supported. But, uh, you know, interestingly, the first mission uh, for HMX-1 was President Eisenhower, when he had to uh, activate the 101st Airborne when they had the riots for the um, segregation uh, down south, he happened to be on Aquidneck Island, where Newport, Rhode Island is, oh. vacationing, and they needed to get him over to Narragansett, uh, which was about an hour ferry ride away. And someone came up with the idea, said, you've got this Marine helicopter here in case there's an emergency. Why don't we call this an emergency? Six minutes later, he was at Narragansett. He took off from uh, a field right by what's now called Eisenhower House. Uh, on the housing for uh, Navy personnel that are there now. And that started the whole concept is, hey, this helicopter uh, it could be a, a pretty good way to get the president around. So both the Marines and the Army, which was they were big into uh, helicopters, still are, mm -hmm. uh, traded duties back and forth until it got too much. In 1972, coordination got too much. You know, who's who's doing what, what day, and that sort of thing. Marines took it all over completely in 1972 huh. with the VH-3D. I probably should have asked you that at the beginning because even not just the Army and the Marine Corps, but the Air Force and the Navy, any, yes. any of the branches could theoretically absolutely. in some ultra universe right now be this unit a absolutely that moves the president if it was right that in the time called for it it could be an air force one it could be a coast guard one it could be uh anybody that would fly if it was required but typical normal procedure is it's always a marine helicopter yeah yeah now we talked about the sharp marine at the bottom of the yeah. steps that meets and what's the name of that uniform that marine wears again that's a dress blue alpha dress blue alpha but that's not what the pilots wear <laughs> but they're not wearing flight suits either no they're not they're wearing charlies and uh squadron lore says that uh back in the early 60s when jackie onassis quite a fashion plate got on her first flight when she was the first first time on a first lady she said oh hey boys you know uh well you know when she got on the aircraft very nice and she asked the mill aide who carries the full uh, the military aide okay. who carries the football uh, in the back what are those little green suits that they're wearing <laughs> oh ma'am those are <laughs> those are flight suits they're nomex and fireproof well, why don't I have one? <laughs> so uh -huh. instead of giving her a Nomex suit to get on the plane, <laughs> the pilots went into what we call Charlie's. It's the, the green trousers and uh, during the summer, the short khaki, short sleeve khaki, mm -hmm. and during the winter, the uh, long sleeve khakis with our core frame plastic shoes. Everything an aviation safety officer, which I was one, would tell you <laughs> don't get in the aircraft with anything plastic on your body. Yeah. Uh, but that's what we fly with, I believe to this day. That's certainly all I ever flew in. However, if you were just transiting
landing the aircraft, say uh, replacing one at Annie, going up the Potomac River, or doing a mission on the green side, you would always wear your flight gear with your survival vest, your helmet, uh, gloves, the whole thing. We weren't cowboys. It was just when you flew the the primaries, uh, head of state, president, vice president. Interesting. And so, uh, you know, in the hierarchy of pilots there is you climb your ladder as freshman to senior, and then there's a parallel uh, designation uh, that you would go up and you would culminate with the presidential command pilot, but there are stops along the way. So you could be a Marine II pilot, uh, and that means that you were able to fly uh, the vice president, again, only in the uh, the local D.C. area. Uh, and I started that way, and my, my uh, first flight was uh, Vice President uh, Dan Quayle, uh, and he and his entire family had just come back from a big soiree or something up in New York, and I met them at Andrews Air Force Base, which was typical. That's where the uh, Air Force Two would come into and put them on the plane and flew them over to uh, the Naval Observatory, where there's an equally tight LZ at night. It was a choppy, lousy wind night with all kinds of burbles going on, and it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a pleasant ride uh, for anyone. You know, it was kind of bouncing around. It didn't bother me. Turbulence is not something passengers like. Um, in any case, we safely got them there and you know, put the ramp down. We were flying the VH-3D on this mission. The vice president gets out and goes to the, even for the short ride just to his quarters, uh, there's a limo waiting for him and a backup with that. Uh, but the kids in, in Maryland Quail don't come out. He turns around from uh, where he was at the, uh, probably 50 yards away and can't figure out what's going on. And uh, where where is my wife and, and kids? And so he, he you know, comes back to the helicopter. Unbeknownst to us, we close a cockpit door, but the crew chief was uh, telling Marilyn, please, ma'am, I can take care of that. I can take care of that. One of her kids had puked on the floor. <laughs> and she said, it's my child. I will clean this up. You know, of course, she became the darling of the squadron from that point <laughs> on. Now, the, the crew chief had to do a real cleanup job afterwards, but she did her level best. And, uh, you know, that kind of interpersonal, it doesn't take much to impress someone if you're at that level. When she took the time to do that, yeah. meant a lot. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, how is the interaction otherwise between the crew and the families, first families maybe? Because you talked about the five folks at the bottom and maybe they get to be better known but the pilots is are there a bigger so, cadre of them and do they cycle through more often so i can only speak to my experience sure. during the uh, last year of president reagan and the uh, first three years of president bush um there are a lot of opportunities. You're not in the inner circle, as I said before, but you're at Camp David when they're at Camp David. They're in a cabin called Aspen. You're in a much less uh, opulent <laughs> cabin uh, elsewhere. But, for instance, when President Bush wanted somebody to play horseshoes with, and if they, he didn't have family members, he'd have the mill aide call down to the uh, pilot's suit and say, hey, you're playing uh, horseshoes. And the, the only rule was he, you couldn't— uh, Couldn't beat him? No. You, well, you couldn't try to lose. Uh, <laughs> You, you didn't want that, uh -huh. but that wasn't a problem because he was fantastic at all sports, uh -huh. whether it be tennis or volleyball, which was volleyball and a racquetball court. He was a master at that. Uh, so you'd get an opportunity to interact with them there. Again, there is no national security discussion or what do you think about the latest acquisition or mm -hmm. for him, mm -hmm. this was his breakaway. Um, he did, uh, uh, during his time, I think 150 visits to Camp David. There's always a Marine helicopter there, of, of course, uh, with that. That's more than President Reagan did, and they did more, more than other presidents. Um, uh, of course, it was Shangri-La before uh, Camp David was renamed by Eisenhower for his son, Camp David. Mm -hmm. It was neat to see them with their hair off. One time we were taking a jog around the perimeter road, the uh, co-pilot and I, and we noticed the uh, first lady uh, coming down, Barbara Bush, out of the uh, hangar. Uh, we have a little hangar in the back corner uh, where the helicopter sits, and that's where a, a, a duty hydraulics men and avionics men are. That's they have a little uh, uh, quarters upstairs, a uh, little barracks, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, maybe four or five beds. She's coming down the back steps. Of course, we stopped. And said, good evening, ma'am. Uh, uh, good evening, boys. And you know, how are you doing? I'm oh, doing great. And then she's on her way, and we're on our way. But we go right back up those stairs and go, what's Mrs. Bush doing up here? Oh, sir, she comes all the time. She bakes cookies and brings them to us. 
She knows better than to bring them to the pilots. The people that do the work are the avionics <laughs> men and the, and the hydraulics men. And, and I guess it was a common occurrence, but, you know, no photo op. It's not telling any interview or whatever. It just was the goodness of her heart. So there, it was wonderful interaction with that. That's cool. Um, you know, when they need people on, uh, for the Easter egg roll and yeah. uh, that sort of thing, those are families from HMX-1, Air Force One, the White House Communications Agency. You know, their husbands or wives have all been cleared already. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty low risk to have them come in there. Those are those, those people. And sometimes they'll have others as well. But the base group that comes in for that is there. To continue answering your question, I don't want to give you too much, but uh, <laughs> after you get your Yankee White and you're in the mission, as mm -hmm. we call it, uh, you're invited to the White House Christmas party. Ah. Now, they have several of those, so don't think that there's only one, uh, but you're, you, you are invited to the White House, and, and going is quite an honor, and you know, you travel a lot, there's a lot of time away from your family, and it's a little bit of a nice thing to give your family to, to have them come with you to, to the White House for mm -hmm. that. And uh, President Reagan actually would uh, have some gatherings, photo ops, if you will, with the wives of Air Force One and HMX One uh, in the Rose Garden. Uh, my wife got one of those pictures. And again, you're not in the inner circle, uh, but they they treat you very well. That's good. Uh, I think they really appreciated the service you were providing mm -hmm. in the time, you know, if they're gone on Christmas, you're gone on Christmas. Um, you know, when, when they were gone on Thanksgiving, uh, that Thanksgiving, I was in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, because that was during Desert uh, Shield, and, and the president went over to kind of talk to the troops before we kicked off in early 91. Uh, and so, again, we had the H-60s all over uh, wherever he was going to visit, just in case there was a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you might imagine we spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of extra time uh, rehearsing the LZs and that sort of thing, ramping up to the war. We just didn't really know what to expect. Uh, we had everything from mop gear to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> difficult environment. Yeah, it is a difficult sure. environment, but uh, it's good. Jim, you talked about the tour being four years. Yes. Normally, as you well know, in the military, sometimes you might have a tour as little as two. Typically, yes. it's about three. Four can not only mess up your timing for different promotion wickets and, and checkpoints and all that, but the job itself is so different. It's almost, dare I say, you can correct me if I'm wrong, off like the normal, if you will, direction the Marine Corps is going. How does a tour at HMX-1 affect a career? You obviously did well. You went on, like you said, spent a long time in the Marine Corps, retired as a colonel. Is it a net positive, I assume, or is it a I, net yeah. neutral? It's a really good question. Yeah. I can only answer from when I was there. Sure. And I went there as a captain or an 03 Navy lieutenant, and I left there as a captain 03 Navy Lieutenant uh, equivalent. uh, equivalent. Yeah. And I got selected that summer for major. But we spent a lot of time in the company grade office that then. So that didn't affect me uh, adversely at all. But the majors there uh, in our squadron back in the day, uh, every squadron would rank their officers from one to last 30. <laughs> yeah, one to 30. And uh, there might be 30 majors in that squadron, several lieutenant colonels and the colonel. Mm -hmm. uh, and working with headquarters Marine Corps manpower, they actually had a standard blurb that they put on their fit rep, you know, based on the selection criteria for this, even though he's 27, you can consider him a one. Mm -hmm. And so that never hurt them fit rep wise during that time. There was a period later on that I understand that that went away and um, you're, you're out of the fleet. The fleet is where you make your your bones for four years. You're right. It can affect you. And and uh, I understand I didn't live it. Uh, promotions weren't um, as forthcoming. Mm. So it never hurt me. It had, I guess it could have hurt me in that I came from straight from 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, which was not flying. I was a forward air controller. Oh. After I was at the uh, Fleet Replacement Squadron, I went to 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines. Great, great tour. I uh, would never replace it. So I was out of the cockpit for five years. Not out of the cockpit, but out of my fleet cockpit. Okay. And they got rid of the Huey, so I wasn't even flying a VH model. Uh, but I'd flown a lot of stuff, and, I'd, and, and I was wiggling the stick, and I was operating. So that gave you a little bit of credit, but not fleet cred. Um, and so my job going out of there was a detailer. My monitor said, right. you've had your good deal. You're going to go be the air operations officer on the USS Okinawa. Uh, and so I said, okay, well, I guess that's what I'm going to be, which is, you know, ship's company, not necessarily a real career enhancer at that point in my career. Uh, but in Bozeman, Montana, I got a call. 
hey, they're de- decommissioning the Okinawa. Where would you like to go? MAG-39. MAG-39, uh, Marine Aircraft Group 39, is our main uh, up at Camp Pendleton fleet squadron. And that put me right back into a fleet squadron as an operations officer, as a, a young major. And that's probably more than HMX-1 is what uh, wow. helped me uh, continue and, and get a command, a couple of commands and finish off uh, uh, as an 06. So, Fantastic. Uh, so what... I don't think it hurt me. It certainly enriched me uh, as an aviator. Uh, it, uh, one day in my logbook, I have five different TMS aircraft logged. Uh, it was a couple of test pilots, one ferry, and a, and a uh, mission or two. I mean, it was an eye opener for me, and I, I just I loved it. I've wow. just become the the generic helicopter pilot. Yeah, if, it, if it's a helicopter, I can fly it. Kind of, I felt felt that way. I've never flown a helicopter, Jim. So you could do that, it. Yeah. You're a naval aviator. <laughs> well, and you could teach me something. <laughs> yeah, like fantastic. That'd be fun. Hey, I'd like to transition, if you're yeah. willing, into the phase of the interview where I get to ask you questions that have been posed to me. Oh yeah. By the folks that support the show. So sure. I I tell my Patreon supporters, hey, I'm going to sit down with Jim Jameson and uh, mostly talk about. Although you've done a lot of things but mostly talk about being a presidential command pilot. Sure. So this first one is from Rick Hartnack. He's a fellow oh, yes. Marine. In fact, he sat right over here when we talked about the C-7 Caribou. Some of these, by the way, we may have already answered, but we'll ask them and just okay. knock them off. But the first one, I think you did answer, why isn't the presidential helicopter a new issue CH-53 with three engines? Well, it, the answer is it just doesn't work for the mission because of the spaces you need to get into. And it is basically a hurricane when you bring a CH-53 in. I mean, it's it's eye-watering. My son-in-law was a, a pilot, a CH-53 pilot. Uh, that's a beast. And okay. it, the places that we would go and the place you'd interact with the uh, the line where, where the president runs the line and shakes hands, um, they would be blown away by a 53 Echo. So it's, it's, it would be a more capable airframe. It's, and it's a a very capable airframe. When it first rolled out, the 53 ha- Echo had a bit of a bumpy ride, uh, had several Class A mishaps or whatever, and may have put in the mindset is, is that as reliable as this tried and true H3 uh-huh. that we've never had a problem with? You know, so why, why would we substitute gotcha. uh, perhaps with that? On that note, Jim, let me ask you something yeah. not related, but it brings up the CH-53. Hmm. Prior to this interview, thank you, the only thing I knew about this mission and these aircraft and everything is, frankly, what you catch on a snippet of the news or in the movies. Right. And in the uh, Sum of All Fears, I think it is, yes. the president's at the football game, they right. whisk him away, and then the, uh, what do they, they have a name for their uh, limo, it's like the whole The Beast. The Beast, thank you. So it gets blown over, and then Marines show up, and, you know, the CH-53s come in, the Marines save the day. First off, is that just movie? I, I assume it's not, but is that related, though, to HMX-1 necessarily? So, so our security that we have have there or not, they were de- depicting an, an infantry uh, company, I think, coming off there, okay. or a platoon perhaps. Uh, ours are MPs, and they're they're providing physical security of the airframes at all times, 24-7, 365 days a year, so that nobody gets in there and does something that shouldn't be done. Mm-hmm. Every Marine's a rifleman, so would they have the capable ability to do that? Um, yes. Is there a procedure that they could have been in that LZ that quickly? Not unless it was pre-arranged. And those uh, Marines from HMX-1 would not be the ones they'd select. They would select a, a, a battalion, maybe a reserve battalion that's up in the area. Um, it wouldn't necessarily have to be an infantry battalion uh, because, as I said, everyone trains as a rifleman in the Marine Corps and has that capability to do that and provide. They were providing per- perimeter security, if I remember the movie correctly. I just remember they show up to where the beast yeah. is upset down and they yeah. retrieve him and yeah. I think they take the president on one aircraft and then of course they try to get the rest of the inner circle on uh, the QRF so a quick reaction force okay. we do have those given that scenario it would not have been out of bounds that there might have been one at the ready but typically if we're going to say take him to uh, Bethesda which was a mission I did uh, for his annual physical you wouldn't necessarily have that right at the ready okay. it, you could get them there but they wouldn't be instantaneous like that yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Getting back to Rick Hartnack, he actually had a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, how do the pilots get to overseas locations, commercial or ride along in the Air Force transport that hauls the helicopter? 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, they stuff them in the back of the C5 and you get up on the flight deck. They have a, I don't know if you've ever been in a C5. They can configure it for seats down below if they want to make it a troop carrier. But there's, I think, 12 seats up on the flight deck with the pilots that they use on their long hauls to swap out pilots uh, when they get to the end of their crew day. So we would go up and, and hang out there. So depending upon the mission, quite often you'd find yourself in the back of a transit Air Force One. Not the one that he was on, but say they were pre-positioning uh, one of the airframes I flew in a 707, uh, Reagan's, but that dates how long I've been around, uh, 707. When it's moving from one coast to the other, we'd catch a ride on that. That wasn't typical, but it was it was something that we do. Same thing for uh, other people that were going to support the president. They'd get in the back of the H3. Uh, we'd put some uh, cloth down so they wouldn't mess up the uh, the beautiful... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, you're uh, not the yeah, president. Yeah, you're not the president. Oh, and they don't get to sit in that seat, by oh, the way. Wow. No, 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 no. That's a, the president gets to sit there, nobody else. We have a thing called a cage tour where you could bring di- dignitaries or families, and we would bring our families in to keep them involved in the mission. They were allowed to sit in there and, and get a pack of the presidential jelly beans that were always right next to the... Uh, the I'm not sure how much he liked that, uh, yeah. but um, uh, with that, did, did that answer the question? Yeah, I think uh, so. I think so. Rick's last question is, uh, what was the most difficult presidential movement you were involved in logistically? Logistically. Ah, logistically, it had to be when he went over to Thanksgiving. I mentioned it already for yeah. uh, Desert Shield prior to Desert Storm. The alert nature of it, um, the number of places he was going to go. We took the almost every asset, every pilot, uh, and we distributed them around uh, the Far East because he didn't just stop. You know, he was coalition building at the time. Right. And again, I'm not in the inner circle, but we supported where he would go to Egypt or wherever it was um, to help keep keep building those coalitions. So we, we were spread out all over the place. So logistically, that was the toughest. Mm-hmm. As I said, uh, our logisticians made it easy on us. To say that I was responsible for in any way for that is would be wrong. Right. But the support people that are just the unsung heroes, again, uh, along with those crew chiefs and others that they're never going to get the limelight. Uh, those are the ones that are actually that did that. So it was difficult, but it wasn't difficult for me. I, I was able to do my mission seamlessly uh, to be ready to, to uh, relocate them if needed because of their their sure. work. Well, but that was your responsibility. Everybody has their job, and as right. long as everybody's doing their job, right. Hopefully, the whole operation works yeah. correctly. Yeah. 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 Talking about logistics, as I said, there's a bar in the back there, <laughs> uh, and it's they have typical beer like Budweiser, Miller. I guess what what you'd have American in, brands. Like. American <laughs> brands, uh, uh, typically. And when it's on the flight line, uh, it's not um, electrified, so you can't keep it cold. So they're all taken out in a cooler. And, of course, on every uh, uh, fifth uh, cool up and cool down, you have to rotate stock. I wasn't involved in the rotating the stock, but <laughs> the crew chiefs and the, some of the mechanics were when they were off duty uh, with that. But uh, the president got in on a particularly hot day for one of the LZs in Texas when he was out visiting Houston, uh, and he's a teetotaler. Uh, we knew that. Everyone knew that. But the beer, the, the alcohol was there for other uh, guests. And very rarely, other than the Soviets, uh, did anyone ever take the stuff or even <laughs> use it. it. But it was there if you needed it. It was a point. And there was a little head in the back, too. Very rarely used. Uh, you know, there's privacy concerns. But the president gets on board and said uh, to the crew chief, I'd love a beer. Super hot. Now, we have an APU that keeps the air conditioner going all the time. So it was nice and cool in there. But he was still uh, pretty hot. And the, and the crew chief happily said, well, sir, would you like a Budweiser or Miller? He goes, oh, I'd like a Lone Star. And we're in Texas. He goes, <laughs> Sir, we don't have a long star. He goes, never mind. <laughs> so he didn't have a beer, even uh-huh. though it was super hot. And from that day on, we carried Lone Star in the uh, bar, but he never asked for it again. And it's not something you offer the president if you wait till he asks for it. So. Uh, <laughs> but again, aboard, one of those sir, interactions. Yeah, welcome oh, aboard. Uh, you know, as a naval aviator himself, George H. W. Right. Bush yeah. was the youngest naval aviator. Uh, whenever we would do a long flight, we'd always get a jog air, uh, which uh, in for non-aviators is sort of our, our go-to for uh, traveling around the country. And we would highlight the route that we intended to take, and we'd leave it on this uh, seat when he'd get in there. Not sure if he ever looked at it, but it was one of our procedures to try to make him, uh, you know, uh, feel comfortable. and uh, Very nice. Yeah. Good. Well, Rick had another question, but yeah. so did another supporter, Michael Dukak. He's from Slovakia. Uh-huh. Uh, he's become a friend. And how many different aircraft platforms do HMX pilots have to maintain currency? You said earlier you flew five in one day. 
Yeah, five and one day. Now, uh, I wasn't necessarily signing uh, for sure. all five. Okay. When you become a presidential helicopter pilot, you're automatically made in any aircraft that you are um, qualified in as a helicopter aircraft commander. You're also made by the commanding officer a post-maintenance functional check mm-hmm. pilot. So if you're out in Jeddah and you need to do a functional check, very rarely did you need to do that. Just but it's case. another designation mm-hmm. that you, you'd have. So... Uh, in my experience, I was qualified to sign for a helicopter aircraft commander in the VH-1, the VH-60, the VH-3D, the CH-46. Okay. And then I was a co-pilot in the CH-53 Echo and Delta, much lower bar, uh, just more of a familiarization so you could support. You'd have to know the, the checklist and be able to run through a checklist if there was an emergency to support the, the pilot in command. Yeah. So. Got it. Matt McDonough says, to what extent does the Marine crew, pilots and enlisted crew alike, integrate into the Secret Service protective posture during transport missions? In the event of an unscheduled or emergency landing of the helicopter, does the crew train to help protect the VIP? Absolutely. Well, it, our very nature is Marines and every Marine sure. rifleman, we have that, but we are not armed, and uh, nor is the crew chief armed. That is left to the Secret Service. We work very closely with the Secret Service. Uh, being armed is not necessary. That's one one more uh, thing that the Secret Service would have to check off their list, and, and it's not necessary because they have plenty of firepower if they need it. And yes, uh, there, are, there are procedures that are practiced with the Secret Service in the event of an unscheduled landing of how you would set up perimeter. We work with the local law enforcement greatly. Um, again, they never get any credit for it, but they spend hours sometimes, never even see the president, in the anticipation of there's an alternate LZ that he might go to, and this is what I'm keeping safe, mm-hmm. but I never got to see the president. But they supported the president and the squadron and the mission nonetheless. Mm-hmm. So that's important. Thousands of people are involved in his movement. Oh, gosh, yes. And so the coordination on the, the inner piece is very strong, but it its tentacles extend uh, as well to the, as you, as you mentioned before, the the FAA, if we're overseas, to the State Department, and there's he may be the leader of the for, free world, but you need to ask permission if you're going to fly over somebody else's country, sure. uh, particularly with a helicopter. You notice it does not say uh, United States Marines on it. It says United States of America mm-hmm. uh, because it is a Marine One when he's flying. It's not a Marine helicopter uh, in that sense. It's a it's a national asset. It's it's the president's. Makes sense. All right. And then Jevin wants us to know, do flight operations and procedures change coming up to and during times of conflict? Now, you already talked about, uh, in your case, in Desert Storm, being over there, but does, does the security situation at home change at all? I guess just based on the intel picture? So I don't know how their current procedures are. Uh, When we were in the Cold War, and then the Cold War ended, Mm -hmm. uh, our procedures did not end. Rather than a fear of an unannounced nuclear attack, there could be a a bevy of other uh, threats that could do them. So we just kept the procedures as strict, the timelines as strict as they were before. Um, There's really nowhere to go in the time of, you know, you you go up the ladder in numbers in terms of preparation. We always were prepared at the highest level you could be. I have to believe they are today, uh, just because you just never know. No, you just never know. Right. Yeah. You know, I jumped off that previous question uh, without thinking to ask, did you ever have an emergency or anything that you had to... Uh, I did. With a president or somebody on board? I did, and it was very benign in okay. the, in the uh, world of emergencies. As I said, these aircraft are just unbelievably maintained. But they still break. They do. <laughs> and uh, mine was a, a different flight in Texas. I had the president on board, and we went to land, and we go through the landing checklist pretty far in advance, even though it dirties the aircraft up and we put the landing gear down. Everything's looking normal and the barber poles are all working. That indicate uh, that the landing gear is down. Uh, and one of them did not indicate it was down. It indicated it was not down. And so uh, we go through our procedures. We bring up, on, not on the president's side, but we bring up dash two or th- three in this case. I think it was three because he didn't have anybody on board that day. He was just a shell game uh, piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, com- came up in formation uh, underneath. Normally we fly form uh, with the uh, dash two uh, over the rotors. Very rarely do you go under. Some tactical situations you do that. Anyway, he came up and observed it best he could from front and back. He said, it looks like it's good to me. It looks like it's down to me. But I had that that darn indicator going, but I don't have an indicator. So yeah. anyway, the uh, 
again, one of these support things. Every place you go, there is a little uh, communications cart. All our communications are digitally encrypted. We have six radios for the president, right? Yeah, so we have all that too uh, available to us. But the VHF that goes down to the LZ control is on a little thing that the WELO, the White House liaison officer, carries around to him to all uh, sites that are not the White House. Although there's a T-card at the South Lawn too, uh, same thing. And we told him what the problem was. He goes, Roger that, we're getting the mattresses. Where are you going to get the mattresses? <laughs> This is a contingency that they've thought of. You can put the mattresses up and land on the mattress. <laughs> uh, fortunately, the indicator is on the non-door <laughs> side, so it wouldn't quite look quite as janky or whatever. <laughs> he got them to the L LZ. I'm kind of slowing up. I take one slow turn um, and then um, try to... Uh, shake it down. These are our procedures. We go through the procedures. We went in and tried to manually put it down, uh, and it seemed like it was down through manual. We went through all our procedures. Of course. Uh, still, the indicator showed that uh, it was not down. Every other indicator was that it was down. Made the call uh, to come in and try the landing just very judiciously. You know, I don't know if you know how a Sikorsky or any of these uh, VH3D lands, there are three landings, the tail wheel, then you come down on the main mount and then rock to the other main mount. And so we came down very, very slowly and just slowly put pressure on that landing gear while we're keeping a lot of uh, torque on the head. So there's a lot of lift being generated, slower and slower and slower. Uh, and there was a ground support person right there. As I let down to the very last thing, he snuck under and stuck a pin in, uh, which is a normal procedure, uh, but he did it very much quick, more quickly. Uh, and so it was a bit of a nothing unusual. burger. Yeah, unusual. And, yeah. and you want to make sure that you don't concern the passengers in the back. Uh, the president never knew. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if in the after action, the White House military office decided it would be a prudent thing to tell the president. But at the time, he didn't need to know. Uh, there was nothing that he could do or not right. do. Uh, but it certainly, it wasn't anything we were keeping from him. Uh, but don't need to concern somebody. I, Did you tell the crew chief? Because uh, oh, I yes. assume you're on oh, yes. okay. oh, yeah. The crew chief, we were sweating, right. uh, working hard, okay. trying to get that thing done. A lot of crew coordination. Uh, again, it was a benign emergency, but, you know, if you didn't handle it right and you, and you had yeah. a collapsed gear, that wouldn't look good. No, uh, sure. And it could be dangerous. Yeah. Uh, it probably would have been. If it was more... I should say, less yes. benign, what would be your protocol? Would you just make a, an announcement if there is a PA in there, or would you actually like call through to the Secret Service? Or Yes, we, we have communications to the, uh, the mill-aid. The okay. mill-aids really are, so to answer that other question, yeah. the mill-aid is our entry into the White House. We okay. don't go directly to the chief of staff or anybody else. We work through the military. Okay. We're a military organization, same with WACA. So that ma major is doing a lot of uh, juggling. That's why there are five of them. They get exhausted, <laughs> and then they go off duty for four days then they yeah. come on duty you know because they're on day on stay on uh and we would call back to them uh and there's just a little phone on a walnut covered uh, desk that's in between one of the uh the bench seats there again beautifully uh polstered uh, uh pointed uh, nice. you'd never know you were inside a helicopter wow you know the, the vh3d and the 69 uh, has a, a different technology but the vh3d has a set of bi filers on the opposite side of each one of the main rotors that uh, that smooths it out when you're flying that aircraft it feels like you're in a fixed wing aircraft doing a 130 knots you're mm -hmm. in a you don't have that vibration uh it, it's pretty amazing it's not very efficient in terms of fuel and other things, uh, but it's really good for a comfortable ride. <laughs> yeah, well, I think efficiency probably ranks lower than yeah, comfort, it, reliability, it, it, right, et cetera, right. et cetera. Yeah, but they, uh, you know, they have open cups of coffee. We don't want them spilling them. <laughs> That's one of the one of the yeah. thresholds. Is that can you do when you're practicing? Can you do the landing without it spilling any without coffee? Without spilling coffee, uh, you put it. Yeah, so. uh, fit rep bullet. Yeah, <laughs> Jim, we've been we've been talking for however long. I always lose track of time in here, but it's been fun because I've learned a lot. But right as as your life goes, this was a very arguably small portion. We did a lot before, yeah. and I didn't even ask you about any of the things you did after. Just give me a rundown of the rest of your career, and maybe we'll transition into what you're doing now. So I, I went I went back to the fleet and was an opso. At uh, uh, HMLA 169, a uh, gun squadron, okay. uh, and uh, did that for two years. Then went to command and staff residence back in Quantico. Right. Over the time that my wife and I were married and in the Marine Corps, we did 13 uh, PCS moves. Not easy on the wife and three kids, no. uh, but they <laughs> they just are wonderful. Uh, 
Anyway, family uh, deserves a lot of credit. Yeah. And I always say three moves is like a fire. If you have something you care about, yeah. it's almost like it's burned up after three moves. Oh, exactly. The movers, exactly. God bless them, but yeah. stuff, right. they, yeah. Yeah, it's hard. I've got one blade missing from my model. <laughs> well, we hit that from the camera, <laughs> yeah, so I'm hopefully so nobody sorry. saw I won't that say one. that, yeah. yeah. Uh, but what happened to PCS move? Yeah, went on to do that, uh, do other things. I was lucky enough to have a joint tour at Scott Air Force Base huh. and did that. I think because I had a lot of flight hours, I ended up with about 43, 50 hours. Wow. I had some credibility in, in the fleet and having been a, a, spending a lot of time deploying as a young officer uh, and then as an OPSO, whatever, they felt it was uh, I could do a joint tour without killing myself. And indeed, I got selected for command out of that cornfield in Illinois, which is what, what we call being stationed at Scott Air Force Base. <laughs> and I, I was probably the highlight of my career was commanding HMLA 367 Scarface right up at Pendleton. Took them from soup to nuts, two-year tour, uh, deployed them, brought them back, brought everybody back. Uh, my wife uh, created a family atmosphere for the squadron. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. It's shared burdens, right? Yeah, it's so shared burdens, but really, that, uh, what she did for that squadron is still in lore. Good. Yeah, uh, that's good to hear. And then went on to become a colonel. And you said, yeah. did I, what'd you say earlier? From 80 to 09? Did I get that right? From 74, 74 to 09. That's right. Golly. Uh, I, uh, my 06 command was Expedition Warfare Training Group Atlantic and uh, spent a lot of time doing uh, what I call the interface of the Marine Air Ground Task Force. Okay. And that's JTACs and forward air controllers, joint terminal attack controller training and forward air controller training. As I said, that year I had a second battalion, first Marine was fantastic. I was a FAC. Okay. Uh, and, and I absolutely loved that we were a special operations capable mu and we got to do the mountain warfare and all that i mean it was it was just great and then i ended up uh, my career as the force marine officer senior marine uh in north island uh coronado and my wife is a hometown gal so it was perfect i was going to retire there uh in 09 uh which i did retire but unfortunately the nation was going through a downturn in hiring and i did want to continue working, so I had to take a job on the East Coast at the Joint Staff for eight years oh dear. before coming back to Coronado. But <laughs> no complaints yeah. uh, at all, and I still keep. I still say I'm a little bit in the Gun Club because I'm the Chief Instructor for Expeditionary Warfare School for Marine Corps University, oh, wow. and I uh, also get to do a little adjunct uh, professor work for the Naval War College and online Naval Command and Staff course that I teach. So I absolutely love that. Coronado is a perfect town. To, if you want to volunteer, there's 20 seven different uh, 401 C3s, and I volunteer in several of them. Uh, I'm working on a project right now uh, for the Avenue of Heroes, okay. uh, where we uh, we honor our veterans, the Coronado veterans that served honorably uh, by putting uh, six-foot posters up down uh, 3rd and 4th Avenue, which is fun. I'm on the committee for that. I get a lot of, uh, I get more reward out of that than the honorees, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, just learning their stories is, uh, yeah. well, you know more better than anybody, but learning their stories is not only humbling but it's inspirational oh gosh and there's so yeah. many stories that's why it's been my honor to have this podcast is to bring folks like you on to mm-hmm. to share these stories and a lot of them if i may brag on you for a moment are a lot like you like oh i you know i didn't do anything special i don't want to be on the show i don't want to self-aggrandize like no there's great stories out there and if yeah. you just tell them the way you lived them that you know people well, it was appreciate. a lot of fun yeah it was a lot of fun good so yeah. that's what keeps you busy these days you're it is it is and i'm um, working on another project with the naval helicopter association's history Historical Society, that's a mouthful, <laughs> uh, Captain Bill Personius, uh, we're trying to put a um, helicopter at the gate of North Island. Right now, there's Stockdale an A4. Gate. The Stockdale Gate. Yeah. His A4 scooter is there right now on one side, and we want to put a Medal of Honor uh, winner's uh, helicopter on the other side. Ah. And so we're uh, fundraising for the NATO. We have the helicopter. We got it out of Davis Month and Boneyard. It's not a Sea Sprite, which he flew. Clyde Lassen was the officer. Okay. He was a Lieutenant JG and won the Medal of Honor in Vietnam, pulling two F-4 pilots to great danger himself out of an LZ, not really an LZ, out of the woods, basically. Yeah. Turned on his uh, uh, landing light to draw enemy fire from the F-4 pilot. Uh, won the Medal wow. of Honor, uh, and ends up, I actually had a chance to fly with him, and I didn't know until I looked in my uh, logbook, he was the commanding officer of the training squadron, HT-8, uh, way back in the day. But uh, we're trying to put a helicopter that's painted in the Medal of Honor colors. It's already painted and ready to go. Uh, we're just getting looking to get uh, the last bit of engineering to put it on a stick. So it'll be bookends, two Medal of Honor winners at that North Island gate. Uh, so And bring some rotary wing to the gate, which frankly, there's a lot of that in North Island. 
it is a, the master helicopter <laughs> base. It would be a good thing yeah. to have a helicopter there. All right. Yeah. Right. Military bases and, and especially in coastal towns, nothing ever happens quickly or easily. Right. So this is taking some effort, I presume. Right. It is. And, you know, the Navy cannot uh, provide any financial support, whatever. They can actually uh, provide permission. The uh, base CO and XO are all about it. Mm-hmm. They want it. But we have to do a private fundraising, and, and we're doing that. Okay. So, And we're having good success with that. Good. So, well, let's, I mean, we're neighbors anyway, so let's keep in touch, and you okay. can let me know, and we'll be sure to uh, promote right. it as best we can here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast yeah. before, uh, or when it happens. But just to end where we started, Jim, what did I not ask you maybe about either HMX-1 or being a presidential command pilot? It sounds like it really was an amazing tour, and it's so much thought and effort and time put into moving arguably one person, but yeah. that one person represents the very maintenance, if you will, or right. keeping of our way of life as right. a country. Yes, and so that's a good point. I don't think you missed any questions, but I will say that we aren't moving the president as much as we're moving the command in chief. Mm-hmm. And that continuity of government is, mm-hmm. is what I want to emphasize. And if I may, I, I just do have to say, and I, I touched on it a little bit, you know, the families, I talked about the unsung heroes that are out, out there, the crew chiefs and the and the FAA, people that are doing things that you don't even know they're doing. But there's a whole other category, and those are the families mm-hmm. that are, you know, I'm in Jeddah, uh, Saudi Arabia. They're not. They're making things work back home uh, or wherever wherever we send any yeah. of our military folks uh, today or back then. And we spent a lot of time on the road, meaning there was a lot of time we weren't there. And that support was just invaluable yeah. to be able to come home to a, you know, a loving family that's still there, right. that didn't give it up, didn't give up. Yeah. Yeah. You're so yeah. right about that. And, and right. God bless these spouses who have to do everything on their own, raise the kids, yeah. take care of the cars, right. uh, pay the bills, put food on yes, the table sir. every night. And meanwhile, by the way, your loved one is Doing who knows what, who knows where. Right. They're and worried about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's harder for the, I think it's often harder for the families, the spouses than, than it is for the military member who are off having these wonderful adventures. And <laughs> sure, there's there's moments of terror put in there, but but typically it's just, yeah. it's not. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I, I don't usually give myself a lot of credit, Jim, but I will say I was smart enough in my first year of podcasting to realize we needed an episode about the home front right away. So episode 34 was right around the holidays, that first year of podcasting for me. And I invited my wife, Beth, and my co-host at the time, Sunshine's wife, Kristen, on. And they talked about that very thing, like what it's like. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate to be home for the birth of all three of my kids, but some husbands aren't. And so it's a big sacrifice. And yeah, I mean, I remember when I met my then girlfriend, uh, Beth, and I told her, I said, look, I'm going to be a military pilot. If you want to sign up for this life, this is, you know, a little bit of what it's going to be like. And I won't always be there and you won't always know what I'm doing. And if you don't hear from me, you can't assume the worst. So yeah, they really do, I think, deserve that credit. I think so. I have not heard that podcast yet, but as on my list, (laughs) I am going to get that done. That sounds great. Well, there you go. I'll count you as an additional listener. So that's really the reason I brought it. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, Now, full disclosure doesn't always get you out of trouble on those long deployments. And when you're out there, oh, they've extended us two months. That's right. That's that's hard news to break. Yeah, well, or if you forget to write or email or whatever, but then you pull into port and you, you know, let off some steam for a couple of days and then like, oh yeah, I better call home. And, uh, you know, your voice is raspy from having a good time. But yeah, it's it's a special life. And Don't get yourself in trouble then. That's right. Those days are over (laughs) for me. So all I do now is this and trying to get back into an airliner, but we'll see how that goes. Good. Jim, we always end the Fighter Pilot Podcast episodes on call signs. I didn't even ask you if you have a call sign. I do. Okay, I haven't even been using it. I don't even know what it oh, is. It's so Boone. It's B-O-O-N-E. Okay. And some people say uh, it's for Daniel Boone because I shoot straight. That's not true. <laughs> Actually, I'm the one that said that. <laughs> don't shoot hey, that you straight. Can make your own story yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. And some people say I walk like a baboon. That's not it either. Uh, when I was in HMT 303, that FRS, I would take every opportunity. This was before I was married, actually, uh, to go on every cross country, every static display, and you name the, the place. And uh, inevitably, uh, come around Monday, the CEO would come in, and the airplane wasn't back. And he'd go, "Where's Jameson? You know, he's in, you know, uh, Timbuktu. Uh, the airplane broke. Oh, he's on a boondoggle again." Uh. So I became boon because I was often. Uh, 
uh, with the, with his aircraft out of uh, out of state. <laughs> <laughs> Did that settle down uh, when a particular lady came along? Maybe. Well, I, I took a lot of cross countries that ended up in North Island because she was living on Coronado. Uh, uh. So I would go from Camp Pendleton, fly six point five hours, and end up in Coronado. <laughs> I didn't get a lot of co-pilot uh, students that wanted to come with me, but oh dear. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, Jim Boone, now that I have learned that, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, let's see, you said 74 to 09. I was trying to do the math so I didn't have to do it publicly. 35 years? Yes, sir. Of uniform service. Yes. Still serving in the things you're doing both in... in As a contractor, full yeah, disclosure. But still, I mean, you're teaching young folks and yeah. you're doing the Avenue yeah. of Heroes and trying to get yeah. a helicopter up to... Yeah. Uh, properly recognize the people that do all that. And if nothing else, you spent the last however long here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast talking about what it means to be a presidential command pilot at HMX-1. So I just want to say thank you for those years of service. And you said 4350, 4250 hours? Uh, 43 something. Yeah, so 4300 hours and gosh, retired as a colonel. I mean, that's a great story. And I really enjoyed our discussion today. So thank you so much. I, I enjoyed talking about it. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. I sure do every time. Now, in case we had some jargon there you didn't understand, go on over to fighterpilotpodcast.com where we have a glossary as well as musings, which are just our blogs, and some cool merchandise that you can check out as well. So we'll see you next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. Yeah.